So we'll now build uh, the simplest possible model of uh, Slack. Uh, so this is going to be a macroeconomic model, uh, but it's going to be uh, very much simpler than uh, the macro models that you typically see. Uh, so uh, despite the simplicity of the model, uh, it's quite a useful model. It allows us to think about aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Um, it'll tell us how um, slack arises um, in the economy. It'll also tell us how um, slack responds to uh, various types of shocks, shocks coming from the demand side and shocks coming from the supply side. Um, it'll be helpful to think about um, efficiency. Um, it'll be helpful to think about uh, various types of policies. Uh, so despite its, its simplicity, um, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be a very helpful model. And furthermore, um, it's going to be uh, the base for uh, what we learn in this course and we'll be able to extend the model in various directions uh, when we need to. But a lot of the insights that we learn um, come about you know, very neatly in this model. So to start with, um, let's um, review the structure uh, of this model um, so that we understand what are the different elements um, that feature in the model. So um, um, what, are the, what are the key assumptions? What are the key elements of the model? So uh, first of all, this model is going to be static. Okay, so if you want, it means that there is just it's just a, a one period model. Now, of course, um, the world is, is dynamic in reality. Um, so we'll see in this course, we'll provide a dynamic extension uh, of the model and we'll see how we can move from that static model to a dynamic model. Um, nevertheless, with a static model and using comparative statics, um, we're able to get a lot of insights into how an economy uh, responds, to, uh, responds to shocks. So um, what, do we have in this, uh, what do we have in this model? Well, we we'll have um, households. Um, so in fact, we we'll have uh, many households, but we, uh, they are going to be uh, of mass one. And um, so here, this is a very simple model. So all the households are identical. So there won't be any heterogeneity. Um, furthermore, we'll assume that the households are large um, so that there is no uh, randomness at the household level. So uh, what I mean with that, that if you have a very small household, say a household composed of uh, one uh, person or, or two people, um, you know, when if you if you're unemployed, or if you if you have two people employed, or one unemployed, one employed, or two unemployed, of course the situations are all very different uh, across households. Then, you know, then we have to keep track uh, of the situation of these different households. We have to keep track of insurance problems. Um, so here we want to simplify all of this, all of this as a starting point, and so we assume that the households are large that. Um, there is no uncertainty. So what's going to happen is that if there is, say, 10% uh, of, uh, say there's 10% unemployment in the economy, instead of assuming that we have 90% of the households that are employed, 10% of the households that are unemployed, which creates uh, you know, some inequality in the model, which is uh, hard to handle. Here, we'll assume that all the households have 10% of their members that are unemployed. Okay? And through this large household construct, which is a typical technique that's employed in the uh, macro labor literature, you can avoid all these issues and you can assume that all the households um, are the same. So there'll be the key thing is that there is no randomness 
at the household level. So of course, this is um, unrealistic, but um, it simplifies the model um, a whole lot. So what do these households do? Uh, so the households are going to do uh, two things. We'll assume that uh, households uh, produce services So they produce labor, you know, they produce labor services. So here, um, what what's very nice with services is that um, if you think about, uh, you know, uh, the concept of Slack that we are mentioning, if you're producing a service and no customer comes to purchase your service, your service is just uh, lost and wasted, right? You cannot store services. Um, so that will simplify the model a lot. Um, so what that means is that you could have exactly the same model if households were producing not only services, but also perishable goods. Because a perishable good is produced, and then if nobody comes to buy it, it's perished and is wasted. So here, the model would behave exactly the same. So we could allow for perishable goods too. Now, if we introduced durable goods, things would be more complicated because if you produce a durable good and it's not purchased, you could store that durable good in an inventory and then you know, it complicates things and you would have to keep track of how the inventory depreciates over time. So here, we don't want to get into these complications. And so instead of um, looking at goods that can possibly be stored, we're going to focus, uh, we're going to focus on services. Um, and so services um, is what's going to be traded. You can see that the other Maybe an unorthodox assumption here is that the household is going to produce the services directly. Um, so here, what that means is that there are no firms. Production doesn't take place within a firm. It's going to take place within a household. Um, So you can think of this household as uh, self-employed. And um, so uh, here as a result, because there are no firms and because all the production uh, takes place within the households, we don't need to separate between a labor market where households sell their labor to firms and a product market where firms sell the production to uh, consumers. Here, there'll be only uh, one market, which would be a service market. So basically, we've bypassed, so instead of having labor market, product market with firms in the middle buying labor, the labor market and selling on the product market. We bypass firms altogether. We just assume that there is just uh, one um, service market where households um, sell their uh, services. And so, so here you might wonder how realistic is it to assume that um, households produce only services? Like, don't we miss a whole lot of the economy if we don't think about goods, pro uh, about the production of goods? But it turns out that no, actually, you really don't miss all that much. Um, so here is a graph uh, that I produced uh, on Fred, and this graph is showing you two things. So it's using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's for the US. It covers 1939 to today, and it's showing you uh, the number of employees in goods producing industries, and that's going to be um, the blue line here, and uh, the number of employees in service, produ uh, in service providing industries. That's the red line. Uh, and what you can see immediately is that well, first, in the entire sample, there has always been more workers in service uh, producing 
uh, in service providing industries that in, than in goods um, producing industries. But furthermore, as we can see, that the gap between these two um, type of industries has widened significantly. So if you go back to 1939 here, um, the share of workers that are in um, service providing industries here, you can compute it that um, 63%, so roughly two thirds, uh, and uh, a bit less than two thirds, and the share of workers that are in goods um, producing industries, that's 37%. Uh, so uh, as a total, uh, you know, as a share of total non-farm uh, employment. Okay, so um, there was a, a little bit more uh, workers in service providing industries and good producing industries. But now the gap has, uh, has widened dramatically. And in fact, you know, the number of workers in goods producing industries you see has been stable around 20 million. And it hasn't changed very much over time. Whereas the num number of workers uh, that are in service uh, providing industries has increased dramatically again from you know, roughly 20 million to uh, 130 million today. So in fact, here uh, today, what, what we see is that we have 86% of uh, all US workers that are uh, pro providing services, and only 14% of all uh, US workers that are um, producing goods. Um, so the vast, vast majority of workers are actually produ uh, providing services. And you can see that um, the number of workers who produce services is just growing and growing. So I think um, eventually, uh, you know, almost everybody is going to be uh, providing services uh, and not producing goods. Um, so this is not a really, uh, so this is actually quite a good assumption to focus on services. All right, so we said that our households um, are selling services. And who is going to buy these services? Well, it's other households. So another thing that households do here is that households um, purchase and consume services that are, of course, um, produced by other households. So the idea is that um, if you want a haircut, you cannot cut your own hair. So you need another household to cut your hair. Um, so we assume that households cannot produce um, services uh, for themselves. They buy services from other households and reciprocally, they are going to sell some services uh, to the other households. Okay? And because you, you know, services cannot be uh, produced at home, they have to be purchased from other households, um, you do need to have a market in which services are going to be uh, exchanged. Um, and so the key thing, of course, as you can uh, anticipate, the key thing is that uh, all services will be trading on a, on, a, on a matching market, and that's what's going to produce uh, Slack. So you will have, we'll have um, a matching function that uh, mediates um, all, the tr all the trades uh, on that market. The last bit of structure that uh, I need to mention that's going to be part of the model is that there'll be money in the model. Um, and so money is going to be used as a numeraire so that means that money is going to be the unit of account uh, for the, uh, the price uh, of the services that are sold and purchased and furthermore um, we'll also see that households uh, will be able to um, hold money. So if they have some income that they don't want to spend on services, they'll be able to just hold that income as money. Um, 
Um, so, you know, in a sense, when you have a dynamic model, if you don't want to spend some of your income, you just save it. But here it's a static model, so there is no saving. So instead of having saving, we just introduce money and household will be able to use money um, to store part of the income that they don't want to spend. Okay, um, So it's a little bit of a, you know, a trick to replace savings in a static model. Um, so money can be held by household. Um, 